which is Christmas. And he's the light of the world. Amen? Amen. I want you to close your eyes with me for a minute. You ever want to do that? Just close your eyes. I know. I hate it when Pastor makes me do this, right? Everybody close your eyes. I want you to just envision for a moment darkness. Just envision darkness. Before, keep your eyes closed. Keep envisioning that. Before Jesus came to this earth, the entire world was dark spiritually, with the exception of one small nation, the nation of Israel. Very few people except for those in this nation, and at many times, many of those in the, that nation even rejecting God. Very few people had any witness, had any knowledge to who God really was. They were living in spiritual darkness. Yes, we know that God reveals himself through creation to all generations, but there was just darkness over the earth. They could not see how to get to the true God, the real God. And so they formed all kinds of other gods and worshipped them. And in their own hearts, in their own sinful natures, they worshipped other things than worshipping the real God. And that's how dark the world was until Jesus came in. For thousands of years. About three or four thousand. Until Jesus came in. And then when he came, it was a light coming in through the nation of Israel, but a light that would spread, revealing God himself to all mankind. You can open your eyes. And yet, still today, there are so many nations in this world that are still in darkness. They have light in them, but yet so many choose to still live according to old pagan ways or old customs and they still live in darkness when there is this great light a light that illuminates the way to truth a light that illuminates the way to eternity and his name is Jesus the sad thing is if we look at our own nation our own nation that was founded by Christians a nation of people that started people who knew what the light was if you look out in our society today there's more darkness amongst even Americans than there is true light. You know, the tradition, don't you know, who's been looking at the lights of Christmas? Has anyone been to any light displays yet? Drove around any neighborhoods yet? Anyone? We all love to look at the lights of Christmas. That all began with Martin Luther. He was walking somewhere in the 16th century. He was walking through the forest on his way home. And he saw the stars twinkling amongst the evergreen trees. And he used those stars to find his way home. And it reminded him that the light of Christ helps us to find our way home to eternity. And with that, he decided he was going to begin practicing Jesus' light in the world through those winter months around that Christmas season. And he brought an evergreen tree into his home and he wired it with candles and he lit the candles. And that's where we get the beginning of the practice of Christmas lights. But now some three, four hundred years later, we have turned the celebration of Christ into a celebration of the celebration. And the practice of lighting lights, which were to remind us of Christ, have now become what many are celebrating. Festivals of light. Seasons of light. We've become, we've taken this season, this Christmas, this holiday, and we've turned it all around to become anything but Jesus. You know, you can drive through any neighborhood today and you will find a blow-up of some form, whether it's a minion or a Star Wars character, or a dog, or a Santa Claus, or a reindeer, or something. Very few. And you'll find these books, and they light up. You'll see people's houses wrapped in lights. You can drive down, you can go out to the, the Botanical Gardens downtown in Denver, and you can see a festival of lights, beautiful. But nowhere, when you look, almost nowhere do you find Jesus amongst all of that. You can go to the Denver Zoo, and you'll see animals in lights. And trees and lights. But you don't find Jesus. We don't even find Santa Claus amongst the lights anymore. Because the whole realm of Christmas has been brought out. And we just begin celebrating lights. 
Kimberly and I, and I got a picture of this, if you bring it up. Here we are, bring the next one up. We went to this display in Phoenix when we were down there at Thanksgiving. It was called Lights of the World. Hmm. So close and yet so far away. Lights of the World. And in it we went and we walked around. There was no Christmas music. There were buildings from around the world that were kind of made like these giant kites or whatever with these lights behind them. There were, I think there's another one, isn't there? Did not come up. It must not have translated into iCloud. And there were all these different things and we walked around. There's no Christmas music. There were a couple of settings of penguins and different things. But there was no sense of anything that we celebrate. I walked away from that going, after having been to the Botanical Garden, and after having been to multiple cities with, with zoo lights and other things, I started realizing we're celebrating the celebration. And how empty has it become? Because we've lost the true meaning of what we celebrate, which is Jesus, the light of the world. Jesus, the light of the world. Of the world. You know, the devil has always been one that wants to rob the glory from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's always been one that wants to rob mankind of the truth. And we used to fight it for, I used to have a teacher in Bible school. You'll, you'll like this one. She took Santa and she switched the letters around. She goes, if you take the N and the T and you move it around, it's the Satan. Because Satan got his claws into Christmas. I always thought it was kind of funny. I'm like going, you know, but if you think about it, so much of the world today, they think that's what Christmas is. They don't even, they don't even go back to Jesus. Santa Claus was originally, was a saint who actually, St. Nicholas was a saint, we talked about this last year, who actually went around doing good for people in the church. He was actually a priest. And he's developed into this magical creature with flying reindeer. Who knows everything? He's omnipotent. He's omnipotent. He's everywhere. He's all powerful. He knows all. And you think how far, but now even he's getting left out. As we get further and further as a society away from the truth. Well, let's talk about a few things tonight, this morning. I got lights on my brain, so I have tonight in my head. The first thing I want to talk about is false light. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, 14, Paul writes, But I am not surprised even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. You know, what does that mean when Satan disguises himself as an angel of light? It means that the devil himself tries to take things in this world and bring deception amongst people by making things look good. He makes them maybe look like they're good things, good causes, good purposes, Good whatever, and he kind of he kind of sugarcoats them or white coats them to try and make things look nice and good, but yet underneath the surface it's all empty. It's not truth, it's not real, but it's part of a deception to draw us away from and to distract us from the real truth. It's to keep people in true spiritual darkness and away from the truth of the light of who Jesus is. In Revelation 12, 9, it says, This great dragon, the ancient serpent, called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. From the beginning of time, he was a deceiver. His name is Diabolos, or or deceiver. And from the beginning of time, he tried to deceive people. He deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden. What did he do? He took that fruit, that piece of fruit, and he made it look so good to her. He told her how this is going to help you. How this is going to benefit you. If you eat of this apple, you'll know all things. You'll be like God. All you have to do is partake of this. And you're going to have the same knowledge of God. And you'll have the same wisdom of God. And you'll be just like God. It's a good thing. And in that moment of Eve's deception and Adam's deception, and when they partook of that fruit, they rebelled against God's one command. Don't eat from this tree. And they fell into sin and all of mankind into its darkness. Did it look good? Yeah. Did he make it appealing? Yes. Did he say it was good? Did he say it would make them like God? Yes. Because that's what he is. He's a deceiver. In John 8, 44, it says, For you are the children of your father, the devil, and you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character. For he is a liar 
and the father of lies. You see, there's great deception in our world today. There's great deception all over our society today. We are starting to call wrong right and right wrong. We don't know what's correct, what isn't, because we've gotten away from this. They make fun of this. Media makes fun of this. Educa educators make fun of this. The world makes fun of this book, and it puts it down, and therefore we're trying to find our own truths. They say there is no absolute truth. When you take out the absolute truth of God's word, you have no truth. Because you either have this truth or there is no truth. But in doing so, we see we're turning the tables and we're calling what's wrong right, what's right wrong. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to get off on a tangent this morning. But you know what? There are two sexes, male and female, period. Amen. When we live in a society that's, that's crazy enough, I saw on the news this week, this one guy, he, 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 was, he was a white teenage dude. And he was referring to himself as a Filipino girl. I'm like, I mean, come on. And I'm a green toad. I mean, I just, you can't, we come to a place where we think if we say it, it must be true. But that's how deception works. Don't be deceived. God is not locked. Whatever we sow, we'll reap. We need to realize that we can't just say it's truth and therefore it is truth. There's a standard. There's a plumb line. And the devil wants to draw us away from this and draw us into the darkness of this world. And as all of society jumps on the bandwagon and begins to, it, it begins to grab hold of all of these things, we're being pulled further and further away from what truth really is when what we need to do is just get back to it. And it's really simple. It's right here. This is not an archaic book. This is a, this is a book that's good for all times. Amen. This book is relevant for every generation, for all people. Paul, when he was writing in 2 Corinthians 11, 1 to 4, he says, I hope you will put up with a little more of my foolishness. Please bear with me, for I am jealous for you with the jealousy of God himself. I promised you as a pure bride to one husband, Christ, but I fear that somehow your pure and undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted, just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of the serpent. You happily put up with whatever anyone tells you, even if they preach a different Jesus than the one we preach, or a different kind of spirit than the one you received, or a different kind of gospel than the one you believed. You see, that's how the devil works. He creates artificial light. Have you ever been on a dark ride, like at Disney or in an amusement park, they have those... You know, the dark rides are kind of the dark rooms and they have black lights on them. Have you been on one of those rides before? You go into them and they seem all kind of magical and mysterious and kind of cool. And if you were there and the, and the power turns off and they flip all the lights on, all of a sudden all the mystery goes away. You see the strings, you see the controls, you see the movement arms. And all of the mystery of the ride goes away because it's exposed by light. The devil wants to keep us in an artificial light. So he can keep deceiving us. He wants to keep us drawn to that which isn't real. And moving towards that which is empty and that has no purpose. So he can distract us from the truth of what is right and good. Which is Jesus. Because after all the false light, we have to come back to the real light. You see, the thing that concerns me with the generations that we're living in is that each generation, as we get further and further away from God, and we tend to go further and further away from this word, our heat and our fervor and our passion for the things of God seem to be waning in the church. And as they wane, the next generation down starts out all the more cold and also gets further and further away from God. I'm not talking about church traditions, but I'm talking about church truths that are found in the word of God. And the further away we get from the light and its heat and its passion the easier it is to believe the artificial light when it comes our way. But then there's true light. Jumping around my notes a little bit this morning. Then there's true light. Jesus is the true light. Isaiah 9, 2 says, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. That was the world before he came into it. The world was dark, except for that nation of Israel that he had set apart to set his light into 
so they could be a light to the world. The world was dark. People did not have truth. John 1, 1 to 14. John writes, In the beginning the Word, meaning Jesus, already existed. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him. And nothing was created except through Him. What was the thing that was created at the beginning of all creation but light? Jesus was there giving life. The Word gave life to everything that was created. He's talking about Christ while He was in heaven. And His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness. And I love this next part. And the darkness can never extinguish it. Amen. They can try and put it out. You know, you might go discouraged. People try to put out the light, but it cannot be extinguished. Verse 6 goes on to say, God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the Word became human and made His home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen His glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. The world was in darkness, and it needed light to come into it. And thus came Jesus. Because you notice our major, there's a light that glows out of it. Because light came into the world when Jesus came to this earth. The first thing that that light did was it exposed the hearts of men. It exposes things. Kind of like when you put out a bright light in your house and you go, ooh, I got dust. (laughs) Oh, ooh, what's that in the corner? I forgot that was there. Big light. Oh, there's a spot on the rug. Sometimes we like it dim. Oh, it's romantic. Ambiance, it's all these good things. Yeah, you can't see. You know, <clears throat> well, you all like it when you go off a candlelight dinner because all the flaws don't show, right? <laughs> <clears throat> Works for you too, guys. We like that because dim light kind of shadows things and you don't see all the mistakes. You know, it's kind of funny in TV. The, the more, have you ever noticed that the more high definition TV becomes, the more fake everything looks out like? I mean, the more high def you get, the more, the more you feel like you're actually on the set and everything in the background just looks totally fake. Because you're seeing so much definition. You see every flaw in people. You can tell when that actor dyed their hair that day or not. I mean, it's like, because all of the flaws come out because of the, it's actually all about light and stuff that helps that all to happen. But light exposes things. Ephesians 5.13 it says, but their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them. You know, people don't like the light of God to shine in their hearts because it reveals what's inside. And often what's inside isn't good. Often what's inside is sinful. It has, it has error. It has wrong in it. But you know, the good thing about it is you can't really clean up what needs to be changed if it's not exposed first. Because the whole idea of Jesus sending his light was to expose our works of darkness so he can clean up our lives and bring us into a new place to call us out of darkness and to call us into his light and to make us into new people. 2 Peter 2.9 says, But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness and into his wonderful light. You see, Jesus uses that light to expose the wrong in our life, the sin in our life, to bring us out of darkness and into light. John 8, 12 says, Jesus, the light of the world, says Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Here 
is a light that shines. A light that John 1, 5 said can never be extinguished. But a light that exposes the wrong of our heart. But when we allow it to sweep out our lives, it calls us out of darkness. And what does it call us into? Eternal life. It calls us into eternity. It calls us into hope. It calls us into all the good things that God has in store for us. Because God wasn't happy that the world was left in darkness. God wasn't happy that the world was left cursed. God wasn't happy that man was what was now taken over by a sinful nature and bound by a sinful nature and bound and drawn away by the deception of the devil. God wanted man back. And he loves you and I enough that he sent Jesus to die, to pay the price, to let his light shine, to bring us back. And don't get discouraged when you see, when you look out at the world and it looks like darkness is thriving because no one can extinguish the light of Christ. But in his light, he draws men to life. If we will choose him. Because there's a false light, there's a true light, and then there's which light we choose. We have to choose light. Which one will we choose? Will we choose the artificial things of this world, the fakeness that seems to put joy in them, that seems to be good, that looks has a shiny surface, but in the end is going to draw us to destruction? Or are we going to choose light that's going to draw us to eternal life? John 12, 46 says, I have come as a light to shine in this dark world so that all who put their trust in me, Jesus is speaking, will no longer remain in the dark. You know, the sad thought comes out of John three nineteen. It says, and the judgment is based on this fact, that God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. And that's where we're at today. The light of Christ has shown. It's shown in our nation. It's shown amongst the people. It's been sent around the world to bring the gospel to people all over the place, but people spend more time loving darkness rather than loving light. We want the artificial instead of the real. Who's got a fake tree? Who's got a real tree? Real tree takes more work, doesn't it? Sometimes what's real is worth it, though, isn't it? I have an artificial tree. Our first year here, I tried to go back to my roots in New England and go out and cut my Christmas tree down. My daughter was up to her neck in snow. And we brought the tree home, and, and it was like just a silly, really looking tree. It was, so, it was so like Charlie Brown, it was ridiculous. We actually went out and bought a, a fake tree and stuck that one up in my office. I'm like, I'm not watering this thing every day. It just takes too much work. You know? But if it's worth it to you, the real does take more work. It doesn't really matter in the scope of eternity what kind of Christmas tree you have. But it will matter in the scope of eternity what kind of light you let into your life. Will it be a false light that deceives and is empty and leads to destruction? Or will it be the light of Christ that, yes, exposes those areas of our lives that need to change? But when we let him in, he draws us towards his truth. He draws us towards it's only when we're living in His truth that we can experience His true joy. It's only when we're living in His truth that we can experience His true hope. It's only when we're living in His truth that we experience His real peace. All of those things are things that come at Christmas. The peace of Christmas, the joy of Christmas, the hope of Christmas. But they won't be real unless Jesus is the center of it. Amen. You can't come. You're not going to find joy in Santa. Because if He didn't bring you what you liked, then you could be mad at the guy. And the lights on the trees, they get taken down a couple weeks later. But his light can never be extinguished. So the choice belongs to us. And you might say, well, pastor, I'm a Christian. I serve Jesus. I serve Jesus. But do you ever find yourself being drawn away by the the deception of this world? Do you ever find yourself being drawn into the mainstream viewpoints of society where they kind of draw us away from the things of God a little bit because everybody else is going in that direction? We need to come back and say, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. There is an absolute truth, and it is light to my soul. We need to get back into this word and see what it says for our lives. We get back to this word and bury it deep in our hearts. We get back to this word because Jesus is the word. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And let his word illuminate his path in our lives so we find a way home, even as Martin Luther found his way home through the lights of the trees that one wintry night. Jesus wants his light to guide us 
all the way till we get to the end. And sometimes in the middle, we get off track a little bit. But that's when we have to come and say, I need to come back. I need to let his light take me where he wants me to go. And I need to choose true light, not false light. Would you bow your heads with me?